Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have with us Dr. Doreen Graham Pichet. I'm always thrilled to be able to say that to you because she is truly an expert in the field of autism. I believe the preeminent expert in the field of autism. And Thank you, Shannon. Good morning. Good morning. It's always so great to see you. Thank you so and much. And we, we're thrilled to have her with us. She's been working in the field of autism for well more than 30 years. And uh, amazing because she's worked with small babies up through senior citizens, everything in between, um, and not just autism, but the, the field of related disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, began. She is the reason why the Center for Autism and Related Disorders exists. She is the reason why my child got the help and support that he needed because she trained a group of people and so many people out there get the benefit of what she's been able to do. But on top of that, she's a visionary who helps us to prepare and helps the the medical field and insurance to prepare for what's coming as we, could we use her more than now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's a great time to have her here. But she's going to be answering you. your questions for the next hour. And we like to remind everybody though at the start of the show that there is no expert in any field who could give individual specific advice in this format. So you can write in questions, be as specific as possible, um, mm -hmm. and she's gonna give you information around that, but it can't be individual specific. That would be a disservice to the individual. Right, absolutely. All right. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right, so I wanna get started with a question that we had that came in, um, if my iPad doesn't fail me now, that mm -hmm. came in at the end of last week um, from a viewer that we've had uh, who's been watching the show for quite a while. She says, I'm a 23-year-old woman with Asperger's syndrome. I also have a rare genetic condition that occurs only in females called Turner syndrome, which causes short stature. I'm four foot 10. It's February, which is also Turner syndrome awareness month. Only 2% of the fetuses with Turner syndrome make it to birth. So I am truly a miracle. I'm so grateful that I'm here. God definitely has a plan for my life. Some Turner syndrome girls also have some form of nonverbal learning disorder. I have met some girls with Turner syndrome that also have some form of autism. So there must be some relation between Turner syndrome and autism. And she wants to know what's the difference between autism and a nonverbal learning disorder or are they similar? What a great, question. A great question. Great question. So uh, Turner syndrome, for those who don't know, is, is a uh, lack of one X chromosome. Um, and females have two X chromosomes. So basically that's what it is. Um, I don't think there's much research on all the different things that it affects in terms of development. But let's put that aside and good for you for um, overcoming everything that is difficult, that makes processing life a little bit more difficult. So NLD, nonverbal learning disorder, is a term we use. It's not really a diagnostic term. Okay. It's just a, a name we use. And essentially what it uh, is trying to describe, it's sort of a difficult, if you think about the, what it actually says, it says nonverbal learning disorder. What that means is um, a person with NLD would have a hard time understanding things that are nonverbal, that are subtle. So for instance, uh, inferences, reading other people's perceptions or, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding how people feel just by looking at their facial expression or like understanding, you know, social, subtle social things. Um, and that's basically referred to as NLD. It is pretty much the same as Asperger's, if you think about it, because individuals with Asperger's have uh, a hard time with dealing with things like, you know, so, n social nuances, abstract social nuances. Um, now, autism is uh, more pervasive than that. Autism involves a difficulty with understanding uh, basic speech and language. I mean, autism itself is pretty much, much more pervasive than Asperger's or NLD because really autism affects all different areas. Like it will affect our ability to communicate. It does affect your ability to attend to anything because you're 
kind of isolated in your own uh, uh, world. Uh, it does, uh, individuals with autism tend to have many more um, uh, difficulties, let's say. So symptoms, you know, so for instance, uh, they often have what we call self-stimulatory behavior or repetitive uh, stereotypical behaviors that are things like lining objects up, you know, repetitively doing a behavior, uh, like turning the lights on and off, or uh, even as, as severe as things like body rocking or hand flapping, all of those types of things fall under self-stimulatory behaviors, which are not often seen at all with individuals who have Asperger's or NLD. So that's kind of one big difference. Another one is just the level of speech, communication, language. So usually with individuals who have a diagnosis of autism, you're looking at a much more I guess, advanced delay in speech and language. So, I mean, I, I have individuals who are nonverbal and we will teach them how to communicate with a uh, iPad, for instance, or an AUG device. Uh, whereas on the NLD side, you're looking at people who generally have um, an average speech. They might have a little bit of difficulty understanding pragmatic speech, which is social language. Okay. So those are things like, for instance, if I say to you, um, yeah, I feel just great, you know, there's a certain irony in my, in, in the tone the of sarcasm. my voice, sarcasm, yeah. sarcasm is one example, or if I'll say, if I say something like, um, well, clearly she wasn't feeling well, and, you know, the inferences that are nuances that are in social language, yes. those types of things are a little bit hard for people with NLD to understand, but they understand language, they understand speech, they can communicate everything else. And so, you know, that is a huge difference because autism is seriously affected by a, a deficit in speech and language. I, so I have a, a couple of questions sure, here because sure. this gets, it's always very confusing to me. Whenever I would hear about someone who's nonverbal, mm -hmm. I would always think, oh, that's somebody who doesn't speak, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, but I'm what I'm what I've learned over the last couple of years is it's more complex than that. Mm -hmm. That the, is it is it correct that the 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 actual term nonverbal means that you have no means of communication, which is it's just isn't just speech. So you're not pointing, you're not uttering, you're not. So that once somebody, I've been told, and and the the community doesn't go by this, and maybe it's wrong, but somebody had said to me that if you're going by the actual definition of nonverbal, then there's no communication, that communication is more than just speech. Verbal communication is more than just speech. So that once a child technically, or a person is able to use pecs or something like that, that they're non-speaking, they're non-vocal, but it is still verbal communication when they're trading something for something or pointing to it. Right. Is that accurate or is that just semantics? No, it's, it's, it's a semantic type of issue that we have in behavior analysis, but let me just, uh, maybe try to separate a few things out here. Okay. So when we talk about nonverbal, and let's just first make a clear statement that nonverbal is a description. It has nothing to do with nonverbal learning disorder. Okay. Zero. And that's the other thing I was going to ask yeah, about. So is that nonverbal okay. learning disorder, that's why it's I said It's entirely that different. Completely different. Got it. Nonverbal learning disorder is talking about people who are verbal who have a very hard time understanding nonverbal nuances. Got it. Okay, it's a okay. completely so different. So that's important. Okay, Very got it. separate. Now, individuals who are nonverbal, in, in behavior analysis, we can separate them. We can say someone is nonverbal or nonvocal. Okay. Okay, so nonvocal means that they basically are not expressing themselves vocally. Okay. Nonverbal means that they also sort of don't understand any verbalization at all, whether it's receptive or expressive. Okay. And it, it doesn't, so in other words, a person could be, uh, let's say, nonverbal, but could be completely communicating on an AUG device. Right. Okay. So, you know, because, because they are communicating, they're, non, they're, they're not using their sound, right. but they are still communicating. So, but nevertheless, this question I think has to do with the very higher level individual. Yeah. And this is someone who's barely even on the spectrum. The only commonality they have with this spectrum is the, the, the inability to understand those very subtle social nuances okay. that we're referring to. Now, 
uh, there's the, the many of these are nonverbal. For instance, with the verbal aspect of what I'm saying is one thing, but the satire in it is nonverbal. Right. It's intended. Right. It's an inference. Or let's say if I talk to you and I don't look at you, that's a nonverbal thing. Yes. Eye contact. All those cues, those social Absol cues exactly. that come. That are that are sometimes it's in in the speech, but a lot of times it's in the body language. It is most of the time in in the body language and how we approach things. Like if I suddenly was to sit forward and start, you'd get an impression of either she's angry or she has something very important yes. to say. All that. That's those are the nonverbal cues. Got it. That an individual with NLD won't pick up on. Okay, okay, fascinating. So, and when they don't pick up on it, they also won't display it in their own behavior. So, in other words, those it's like sometimes you'll see someone with NLD standing real close to you. Yes. They don't understand that they're within the bounds of your territory, your personal space. They just don't get that because yeah. they don't have that feeling themselves. Those are the differences. And so. Would it be safe to say that if we were thinking of this as the you know the old time circle sets uh, that for people who have Aspergers it seems like a lot of them have an LP. Ha yes. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. So the way that I look at it is like autism, right? Yes. And then what we used to have pervasive developmental disorder, autism in itself is just very different, broad. Then you have like individuals with Aspergers who have they're not really you can't put in my mind Asperger's doesn't exist anymore by the way it's a it's a yeah. subtype of autism now but I don't even think it should be I don't think it's the same type of issue individuals with Asperger's do however in my mind have a few more issues with language um, than people with NLD NLD okay. we're talking about individuals who have usually very advanced language actually their language is very sophisticated uh -huh. and uh, they can write creatively and they can do all these sorts of things, but their reasoning skills are sometimes affected. It's just because they can't read these social cues. Here's the, here's the traditional test for NLD, by the way. Okay. Um, the test started out in, at Yale Child Study Center, and it's a very cool little cartoon. You know how we have for Theory of Mind Deficit, we have the Sally Ann cartoon? Yes. Yeah. Which individuals with NLD might have a hard time with as well, by the okay. way. But the this cartoon is it's a um, it's three shapes. It's a circle and a square and a triangle. And that's all they are. They're just shapes, all right? And they're um, moving around each other in a way that any if you look at it, if I look at it, Shannon, I can immediately tell that the circle and square are friends because they're playing together and okay. then the sur the triangle keeps trying to play with them but uh -huh. doesn't and then the triangle becomes depressed uh -huh. and then like attempts a few times but then becomes sad and then eventually either I don't remember the circle or the square go over and like bring the triangle and then the triangle <laughs> joins them okay okay so you and I can easily tell that by the way the shapes move right an individual with NLD won't okay they can't read Things into. like friendship, sadness, all this sort of stuff, which is from three nonverbal uh, okay. objects that are just shapes. They can't figure that out. And that's a very subtle thing. Yes. So now we, we yeah. talk about basic things like facial expression. A shape doesn't even have facial expression. Right. But there's much more that we as humans read from each other. It's facial expression, it's eye contact, it's tone of voice, it's how we move in relation to each other, it's a million things. And those are the things that NLD people have a hard time with. This is fascinating for me because okay. I don't think I ever had, uh, I think I had turned this, heard this term before, but I don't think I understood in any way, shape or form what it meant. And you know that people who are familiar with the autism community often speculate, they meet people. I have said before that I, I meet everyone mm -hmm. and I, 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 think, I think that we're all a little bit on the spectrum. Oh, we have I different agree. symptoms. And so I wait till people reveal to me where on the spectrum are they? Because right. I just assume that we're all, we all have our things, right? But you know, there are discussions that people have where they'll look at somebody and they'll go, you know, I've always wondered if this person, but I certainly have met people in my life that I've said, okay, 
I don't think that they, they, no, they don't qualify for a diagnosis Mm -hmm. of Asperger's or autism or whatever, but you definitely see that there is a deficit in their ability to read what's happening. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, and I and and I and I have friends who are like, "Oh, come on. You don't think that that's Asperger's?" And I'm like, "No, it's not Asperger's because it's not this and it's not that that and da da da." Right. But right. maybe it's this. So that's so that's really interesting because see, I always um I always look at when you're because I'm a psychologist first, right? Yes. So, so you, you're qualified to diagnose. Well, the rest of us are just speculating. No, no, it's just because you spend a lot of time learning how to diagnose, right? Yeah. And the diagnosis depends on, as best as we can, identifying a number of symptoms that all cluster together. Mm-hmm. So, for example, and I always use this example because it's kind of an interesting one to me. The a, some, for something to even have a name, it ha, or in the book, right? NLD yes. doesn't. Let's, ah, let's start there. Okay. NLD is not a diagnosis. Okay? okay. NLD is a term that people have come to use. Okay. Okay. So I could say I have NLD just as much as I could say I have humor. Okay. okay. It's just something we do, we okay. have or don't. Now, with um, uh, in the, the things that are in the book in the diagnostic manual. They are very specifically based on a number of symptoms in each area being there. So like when I talk about alcohol dependence or alcohol abuse, or that, that was the area I found very interesting because for two things about it. One is, first of all, you have to have the specific number of symptoms. Why is that? Because unless you have the specific number of symptoms required for each disorder, you're still functional. You're, and see. nothing is classified as a disorder unless it makes you not functional Got at it. work or at home. And that's a very specific thing. Okay. And it's not so very, very clear, like for kids, because they don't go to work, it's at school or at home. Right. So in other words, with autism, right, you have a series of symptoms. And if these symptoms are even the lowest level a one one right they're still present right and they contribute to you having a hard time in school yes. or at home right okay so now asperger's will has fewer symptoms and different symptoms than yeah. autism individuals with asperger's often don't have a language delay so but they still it's still a form it's still there because the belief is that it does make life a lot more difficult for them. Certainly. Now, NLD individuals, probably it makes life difficult for them too. But then there's so many other, as you said, um, Shannon, I agree. I think we all, let's say autism, you know, mainly consists of these repetitive behaviors we have, which I think are mainly have to do with pain or anxiety. Right. So I agree. You know, <laughs> so we have pain or anxiety, then we have the communication issues, which I think have more to do with sensory than anything else, right? Okay. And then we have all the kind of advanced things that get delayed because of those two things, right? Now, you can have any combination of these things, and there's not a name for every combination. There just right. isn't, right? There's only, that's why we call it a spectrum. There's not a name for someone who has you know, a very mild social-ish deficit, like mild on the social communication and severe. There's nine combinations of autism spectrum disorder. Wow. You know what I mean? Because there's three levels of severity and they can be applied to these three, actually two areas, so three to six different types. Right. Actually, no, it does still add up to eight or nine because you can have different combinations. So there's a lot of different, none of them have a name. Right. But an individual who's very, very delayed in language is going to be very, very different from an individual who's very, very delayed in social. Yeah. They're just different. They're extremely different. You know what I mean? Yes. So that's the thing. For To get back to this, NLD only means you have an issue with those nonverbal cues Got it. of the environment. That's and you might what that still means. be like incredibly functional, but you have difficulties with these things. Oh, thanks for saying that. Okay, now what I think is, and I see this in our kids and in our recovered adults and in a lot of adults that we teach, and in your son as well, 
they overcome these things because they think about it and they practice and they realize what it is. And so like instead of being someone who uh, used to have a hard time with that, they become even better at that mm. because they see it, they like train themselves to, you know, none of us walk around thinking about it's funny because like, okay, so you know how we say girls generally have better intuition, yeah. right, than boys? Okay, yeah. I don't know why that is, it's probably right. true, but boys also just don't mind being clueless. Like it's just part of their persona, right? right. They're not supposed to read a lot of emotion into everything and right. try to figure out how people, why don't you just tell me how you feel, right? Right, right. <laughs> It's a very typical statement from a male, not a very typical statement from a female. Right. You know? Yeah. But th I think with our kids, what happens is they are that person to begin with where yes. they can't read it, but then we teach them to pay attention. Like, look at the look at how fair her face was. Did you see? Did you, was that a sad face? Or how? Yeah. So they get so good at it. And I think that's where Jem is. Jem sometimes points out stuff to oh, you yeah. that you didn't notice. Yeah. That's because he's become like a little psychologist. He's become like yeah. an, you know, he analyzes things. Yeah. I see that in a lot of our kids, that they get to a point where their analysis of others is better than the general population. And for anybody who feels like, oh, well, you know, that's putting something on them, it's giving them a toolkit. They have the opportunity oh, sure. to use it or not use it. Oh, for and sure. I see that for my son, when he uses the toolkit, he will say to me things like, if he sees me starting to e me escalate, well, with you. like, yeah. you know, and he'll say to me, I think you need to stop. I think you need to drink something. I think you need to sit down and think about it because this is not the end of the world, mom. You know, he, he like skill. talks me off a ledge. <laughs> I mean, what an amazing yeah, thing, really right? Yeah, it really is. I always say to him, you are going to make somebody a wonderful boyfriend. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know what? I feel, you know, my all the people at CARD tell me that I use a lot of psychology in my practice and just running the business. And it's true. When you know those things, yeah. there's no question you're going to look at someone who's talking to you and understand immediately, oh, this person has a lot of anxiety. What they're saying is probably not exactly what they intend. Right. It influences you. Yes. So, but I will say this, that you, I, I, I have seen you use, use your talents on me and other people, and you do it in such a way that it is not, like, we don't even notice until afterwards. I don't sit there and say, hmm. Yeah, you don't, you don't give us the technical terms. My, yeah. I think what you're suffering from right now is anxiety, Sharon. Right. No, you, you deal with it in a, in well, a, thank in God, a, in a really subtle way that's really clever. But I, on smart. just going back to this question, I guess the summary of all that is that if you do have an NLD or if you feel you have NLD, then you definitely can overcome NLD uh, in a lot of different ways. And it, sh it is not something that w should hold you back at all in any way. And um, <clears throat> in fact, there's more and more of it these days. Yeah, so. there's information um, available to you about how to overcome these things, and there's more and more ways that you can get services to how have you know right. a class or one-on-one -on -one support to to be able to learn. It's just exactly. it's just stuff that needs to be learned. It's not right. uh, it's not physics. And it's not something where you have to knit something and create right. something from nothing. It exists already, and, and then you can know the finer points. Exactly. It's pretty fascinating. Um, all right, we should take a break. And okay. then when we come back, we're going to do a follow-up on a question that we had l last week, and then we're going to start to get into some of the new questions. So stick with us. Nobody ever asks a kid with autism, what is it you'd really like to do? At this school, we ask the kids, what is your goal? What is your dream? Exceptional Minds is a vocational training program for young adults on the autism spectrum who want to have careers in computer animation and visual effects. I think young people with autism are totally underestimated. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And they all have different talents, different skills, and what surprised me is that there really are no limits. That if these guys believe that they can do something, they really can. It's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of young adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. A lot of young adults still live at home, a lot of them suffer from depression and are very isolated from the rest of the world, and the opportunities for them are very limited. 
We want to develop careers for our young adults. Our full-time program runs three years, at the end of which we have job placement and job coaching. We have a work readiness program. We also have our own in-house studio so that when our students graduate, they can do on-the-job training and work on real projects. We outsourced about 30, 40 shots to the team here. They did fantastic work that we can put into a movie and be proud of it. It's great. I mean, we want to do it again. The studio is their first step into the professional world, their first step in their new careers as digital artists. The whole purpose is to get the students out into the real world. We all have the same dreams. We want significance, dignity, and purpose with our lives. We have an opportunity to give those three words to every single student at this school who will actually be able to go out and participate in the dream. This is my first full-time, full-paying job. I primarily work in After Effects. I learned After Effects at Exceptional Minds. It seemed like a good place for me to fit in because I was interested in animation. Right from the first day that Nikki set foot in our company, he was producing work for us. We saw what level of professionalism is being instilled in them from the very beginning. This was the first opportunity where Nikki could combine something he loved to do with something he was really, really good at that could eventually lead to employment. When we first met Kevin, he was working at a supermarket bagging groceries and they said he would never amount to anything else. I work at Stargate Studios and uh, I'm a junior compositor. I mainly do like rotoscoping right now and I'm still learning. I think that you find great talent in the most amazing places. The students at Exceptional Minds have had a fair amount of training to get them ready for the visual effects environment. If it wasn't for Exceptional Minds, I might still be at the supermarket and I might be living at my parents' house. Everything's changed. Nikki has purpose. It feels like I'm a member of society now. He's capable of making it on his own. Once you get inside and you see what's really happening there, you immediately want to be a part of it. It's the dream factory, you know, it's the movie business. And, and if you can connect people with their dreams, then the magic happens. At Exceptional Minds, we like to say that we are changing lives one frame at a time. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. I want to go to a follow-up of her question that we had last week. We had a mom who had written in about um, looking advice for her son's anxiety surrounding sleeping and thinking that he disappears when he goes to sleep. Uh, she said, I really appreciate you and Doreen taking the time to answer my question on air, especially with me being halfway around the world. The fun thing about the internet is mm -hmm. that you're you exactly the same people, distance yeah. as anybody else. Exactly. Makes That's it really a nice cool. way to say it. So, um, so uh, she says, my son just turned 12 years old and has a diagnosis of autism, ADHD, and learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. He's very verbal and he's always very interested in the world around him. However, I feel even though he is 12 years old, his real maturity is that of a seven or eight-year-old. He takes medications for his ADHD um, and she, I, I'm so bad at names of medications, but Equisim, mm -hmm, uh, she so. lists the, the, diag the, the amount. He also takes out eight milligrams of melatonin in the evening along with two milligrams of Guanfacine. Okay. And tuna. I'm, I'm going to take your word, word for that. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, he doesn't suffer from seizures or sleep apnea. At home, there is myself, my husband and son. We have only the one child. Myself and my husband uh, take turns to lie beside him on his bed at night to offer comfort when going to sleep. But he does wake during the night and shouts out for one of us to come back in and lie in his room again. I feel the fact that we leave the room during the night might be making his anxiety worse. Uh, the idea from Dr. Doreen on him wearing a band all night 
light is brilliant and I will definitely, I, I love it when people recognize your brilliance because I always say that mm -hmm. you're brilliant. Um, and she says, I will definitely be trying it. Would it be better to focus on reducing his anxiety surrounding sleep and then begin withdrawing from, and then begin withdrawing from his room? And she says, I really appreciate any advice you could give because you, we know, and you say this all the time, when one of our kids isn't sleeping, no one is sleeping. And then everybody's ability to cope goes right out the window. I know this firsthand. I air hug feel for you. Absolutely. I mean, I think I two nights ago I didn't sleep at all and I was just really exhausted because I don't know we just had our first retreat for our supervisors yes, so I, heard I didn't have a weekend so I was just really tired and then like not having a night's sleep I was just I was a wreck yeah like you just sleep is the most important thing so um uh, so first of all, and you know, I, you saw my response to this, right? Because yes. I couldn't wait. It was late at night, I think, yes. and I was like, I need to get this info to this parent right away. Because I was like, so I emailed you about it, but this, but I have not shared that with okay, her yet. Okay, great. So, so let's talk about that. Yeah. So um, this is uh, Equisim XL is ADHD medication. It is pretty strong. He is on the maximum dose of this, sixty milligrams. He's 12, I don't know how big he is, I assume he is adult size. Um, that is most likely what's causing him anxiety. Uh, I, it's very strange, sometimes we have ADHD medications are basically stimulating, they're extremely stimulating, they're, um, you know, amphetamines. Yeah. And so he is, that is, go, is what is causing him, that could be what is causing him anxiety. What I would do, and and yes, it is better to focus on reducing his anxiety before withdrawing from his room, but that means you need to start reducing his medication. Um, I would very seriously recommend that you look into doing that and that you talk to his physician. Um, there are, this is XL, so this is extra long, it la so that means it, it's lasting all day long. Um, there are the, the you have several options. Either you could go to a lower dose, or you could get him off XL, which means it will wear off by the time he's sleeping. Um, and my, I would track what whatever it is that you think this medication is doing for him right now. So let's say it's supposed to let him focus, right? measure that somehow. In other words, give him an activity that requires heavy focus, attention, um, get, get a baseline. So like, let's say a timed activity such as, um, you know, doing a basic crossword puzzle or doing a basic uh, worksheet that has questions on it that are appropriate for him that he, and time it and then measure like exactly how many he can respond to now and do that for like two days and do it a few different activities and get a baseline. It doesn't really matter. The point is not for him to get 100, 100% on this It just get his baseline, get his current functioning and write it down. And then start talk to his doctor and, and get him on a lower dose or get him off the Excel. And probably a lot of people prefer the Excel because there's no like, with ADHD meds, you know, you have like a sudden drop when the medication wears off. So you keep them on the Excel, but I would reduce the dosage. I think the next dose is 30 or 40 could be, there's 30 and 20 and 10, I think. Um, reduce the dosage and then give him those tests again and see if he actually changed. Okay. Because that's really important. And if he did change, if you saw, a C and wait because once you get him off the dose reduce the dosage just you know retest them a week later give him a little bit of time for his body to adjust to the okay. new dose and then test him i don't think you'll even see a change in his attention and i think he'll feel a lot better it, take one of these yourself I, I always do that i always like to test on the kids it raises your heart pressure it's just you feel like your heart is beating now if you it's funny with anxiety it's like a lot of actually other things. It's this is an interesting experiment. It's like anyone who is really kind of sad, okay, just pick yourself up and sit upright yeah. and like really pay attention. Like sit at upright, you know, and you'll immediately notice that your 
tiredness or depression or whatever will decrease a little bit. It's the same thing with anxiety. If you feel your heart rate, you start to feel anxious because yeah. you're like, what is that? Like, because that feeling of your heart racing has been associated with other times when you had anxiety. It's the fear response or fear, f f fight or flight response, you know? Mm -hmm. Your heart rate goes up. So if you, with these medications, our pulse is usually faster, our heart rate's stronger, you feel it. And you know, you're, it's speed. So you're kind of like a, a little bit agitated. And that most of the time, in fact, anxiety, depression, or, or anxiety is one of the side effects of this medication. Okay. And, and you know, so, sometimes and also we don't know that. Things like headache or uh, like nausea, all these types of things come with these medications. You have to watch out for them. And so good, good for her to be able to know that. And I do, I just want to piggyback on what you were saying about, you know, put your body in the shape of. That's literally the phrase that we use. I, you know, because my master's degree is in theater. I used to teach college theater. There you go. And we would teach, you know, young freshmen would come in always and go, you know, how do you do the thing where you just make yourself cry on cue on stage? And like it's some big fascinating yeah. mystery kind of thing. And what we would do, and it's a little bit more complicated than this, but what we would say to them is you put your body in the shape that you that your body is in when you cry. Right. If you put your body in the shape of of how you cry, it sets you up and, and then you, you can start you do, to cry. Yeah, yeah. And on the flip side on our um on our Thursdays when we do our mindfulness moment, we, we cover on the study, uh, on the show, the study that they've done recently about d taking two minutes during your day and putting yourself in a superhero pose. Mm -hmm. So you stand with your, you know, hands on your hips and your your feet apart and your chin up like you're Superman, and you do that for two minutes, That's and that right. your performance throughout the day. There are three different poses that you can do, but I like that one. I do it That's in the elevator here sometimes. The, your performance on things gets better as a result. Surgeons are doing this now before surgery. Really? Yes, that because it, they have shown that it absolutely makes you perform better. Two minutes. That's amazing. So putting your body in the shape of um, whatever, I just had to, to piggyback yeah. on that. But great information to know because I, it, yeah. it's so frustrating as a parent that you go to the doctor and you get those limited times with the yeah. doctor and they go, take this medication. You look up what symptoms yeah. are, but to know that that particular medicine is likely going to cause anxiety uh, I, in your child. Right. When a lot of anxiety times, is the thing you're fighting. Oh, yeah, definitely. And a lot of times we have anxiety associated with ADHD just because all the meds are causing it. So you just need to really look at that. And, I, and, and please write in again because I'd really like to see uh, if that starts to help the reduction of anxiety, at which point you need to start fading yourself out. Okay, we got lots of questions coming in from lots of different people. Somebody wrote in and, though, and said, um, first of all, uh, our mom, one of our moms in India wrote in and said, if you change the time of when Dr. Doreen is happening, we are on a time oh, change right. right here because of daylight savings time, but we still have just over 15 minutes left because she said, let me know how much time there is left, just over 15 minutes left of Ask Dr. Doreen. Um, Stella wrote in and said, I've been researching but cannot find the, the square, the circle, and the triangle. Oh. Um, do you know what it would be called? Do you know what she said should search for? <sighs> search for nonverbal learning disorder um, shapes. Okay, and we'll try to find it too. Or, and if, yeah, and if yeah. we find it, we'll post it on our Facebook later on today. Um, and in just a second, we had somebody... I, I, I think the person who designed it last name is Sparrow, S-P-A-R-R-O-W, I think. Okay. I'm just going by memory. But we'll now. try to find it too, and if we find it, we'll post it on Facebook. Um, and now I'm gonna open a whole can of worms because we had somebody who wrote in and said, you cannot recover from autism. Yes, progression in areas of development, but to completely recover is false. So we're gonna address that, because I can't not, right? Um, and I so appreciate you writing in because these are exactly the kinds of things where we, we tend to sometimes butt heads. And I think if you'll stick around, we're gonna go to a, a commercial. I think if you'll stick around, you'll be warm to the place we're coming from. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna like optimistically promise it and then you can come back at me and say it's my fault later. So don't go away. But first we have uh, Christina Adams is watching oh, and great. so we want to say hi to Christina and all the hi, other people Christina. that are watching and we are going to show um, the first segment of uh, Autism and Beyond with Christina Adams. So take a look.
Can you have a life with autism? Absolutely not. Give it up right now. No, that's not true. I'm here to tell you, you can have a life with autism. I have a life with autism and it's a good one. When you start on this journey, you don't know what's going to happen. You really have no idea. You're kind of in shell shock for the first couple of years. It could be as long as five years until you realize I do matter to people. When my son was first diagnosed, I remember thinking I would go anywhere and do anything for him. I didn't even think about it. I just came way at the bottom of the list. However, after a few years passed, I realized if I'm not important anymore, then that means no one's going to be here for him. So how do you have this life with autism? It's not easy. It's never going to be easy, but it can be done. It's really all about support. And support is a word you're going to hear a lot when you deal with the autism power structure. And that means schools, government agencies, um, social service agencies that can help you. There are things out there that you don't even know exist. So once you start connecting with other parents, you're going to kind of find this treasure chest full of things that only they can help you unlock. But once you get that support, it could be a babysitter coming to your home. It could be a therapist to take your child out and get him into the community. You can either leave the house, do your shopping, you know, go to a farmer's market, do whatever you want to do. And it doesn't matter if it's really only about 5% of your time. As long as it's dedicated to you, that's going to help. It's all about your willingness to find support and your willingness to accept change and your willingness to kind of stick up for yourself because you're battling for your child and you have to realize you guys are connected. You know, there's a bond between you and your child that can never be broken. And if you're doing well, then your child's going to do well. So finding what you need to be happy, whole, and healthy as a person is a way that you can have a life with autism. And that's important too, because if you have a life with autism, you can also give your child a life too. Welcome back and we're so excited. This is a new series that we have with Christina Adams and we're going to be um, debuting more of them in the coming weeks. So exciting to have her contributing her wealth of knowledge here on the show and, and we want to send a big warm thank you to her for taking the time. We got to go and spend a lovely day with her That's awesome. at the beach and at her, at her home. Christina. That's She's great. amazing. And she anybody is. who hasn't read her book, uh, A Real Boy, you've, you're missing it. That's all I can tell you. Uh, you must read it. It's, Absolutely. She's a lovely writer and it's a beautiful story of a mom and her son going through a CARD program. It, it was my Bible in the six months before we started at CARD. It really... Uh, and, and it's also uh, so much more. It's like the experience of, of autism and so on. It's a great book. It gave me permission to feel all the things that I was feeling and, and to move through it and keep, and keep going. Right. Um, which was huge because if you don't know, you don't I know. I remember when, I, when it first came out, I gave my, mo my mom uh -huh. two books to read. One was this uh -huh. and one was Let Me Hear Your Voice, oh, which yeah. is another classic yes and she loved this over that well of course <laughs> i i remember saying see i just got chills <laughs> because i remember saying to my mother um when i told her that jem had autism and she was like oh no and her, the, she was crying on the phone and she said oh no not our baby and i and, and i remember at that point i said to her i said he's exactly who he was yesterday we just know more about what we're going to do to help him and then shortly after that after i'd read a real boy i said i'm sending you this book i want you to read it this is what we're going to do mm -hmm. um you need to get on board because this is exciting Oh wow! And um, and so she read it and was like, "Okay, then." You know, it had taken awesome. her a little while, but you know, she got on board. So great, great, great book, and Amazing. we thank Christina for all of her wisdom. Okay, so before we went to break, I mentioned that we had somebody who wrote in on Facebook who said, "You cannot recover from autism. Yes, progression in areas of development, but to be completely to to but to completely recover is false." And, and this is, you're not alone in feeling that. And I've talked before on the show that I have um, individuals, good friends who are on the autism spectrum who tell me they don't like the word recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I've pulled back from using the word as often as I do, but I don't pull back from talking about what it is that we're talking about when we say recovery, right. because I, that's real. So absolutely. tell us I, what I'm that never going to pull back because I, it's so important to so many people what, they've, yes. what they have accomplished. And I don't want to detract from that. So I, I will, I'll respond to this, but I also want to ask a question. Okay. And here's my response first. My response is, and it's, it's a great show to have this discussion on, because earlier in the show we talked about diagnosis. 
And, and here's the example I'll give you. Someone can um, drink alcohol. Um, they can drink a whole bottle of vodka mm -hmm. every night and um, they can get drunk. Um, however, they can be completely functional at home and or at work. Mm -hmm and their uh, family isn't necessarily recognizing that as a problem and at work they get up they go to work they do their job they come home they're moving up nothing is changing so in that case this individual would not be diagnosed with alcohol abuse they just would not receive that diagnosis if they had before they would be classified as recovered from that diagnosis because they do not meet the criteria that make them dysfunctional. That's what I was trying to get to earlier yeah. when we were talking about this. So a disorder is by definition something that causes disorder. <laughs> it causes an inability to function in one of our two environments, whether it's home and work or home and school. And if a person has a series of symptoms and they do not need, meet the needs of the disorder, the, they don't, the criteria of the disorder, right. they don't have the disorder. It's very simple. So in, in autism, you must have uh, uh, the number, the specific number of symptoms in each area, which is social communication and in uh, repetitive stereotypical behaviors. You could potentially have a serious problem still with social communication. Many people do. But then that would be called social communication disorder. It would not, no longer classify as autism. Right. You could, for instance, have self stimulatory types of behaviors, but no social communication delay. In that case, in most cases, that's anxiety. So it's kind of like you, you, know, you have to have these symptoms to have the disorder. So anyone actually who doesn't have all of the symptoms it, it could be classified as recovered. Now what happens with our kids... If they had had it at one time. If they had it, exactly. So with our kids, well, they start out obviously having all of the symptoms. Over the course of time, we teach them a lot of speech, we teach them a lot of language. They very quickly, that leads to additional social behavior. We develop their social skills. As you know, we work heavily on that. Um, a lot of times we find out the underlying cause for their repetitive behaviors. We eliminate those. And uh, over the course of four years, sometimes five, sometimes ten, as you know, some of our kids are involved with us for a long time, um, all of those things are gone. They're gone. And now this is an individual who is in normal school without help. Um, and they are functioning great. They have friends with many, many, many children like this. Yes. They have friends. Um, no one could see this individual and say, oh, there's something really strange at all. Right. In fact, a lot of our children have gone and seen a new psychiatrist, a new psychologist, and their diagnosis has been completely removed yeah. because they do not fit the criteria for the diagnosis. And they're functioning great. They are in first, they're in first, second, third, whatever. I mean, my kids, as I said, my recovered adults are in college. So from my perspective, they have recovered. Now, I, you know, English is my second language, and it wasn't until many, many years later that I, someone told me, oh, there's, there's something in the word recovered that gives people the impression that they're coming out of something bad. I don't know. I, still don't know that that's true. I still don't really see that. Um, I feel like whatever was, I, the way that I look at it is you, you can become, you are recovered from having hearing issues when you put in a hearing aid. You are recovered from having visual issues when you wear glasses. Recovery is recovery. It's like, you know, you have overcome a series of things, whether they were medical or environmental or whatever they were that you no longer they don't affect you in any way anymore so that's why i use the term there is clearly in my uh, mind there's no negative associated with the term in fact it's positive because individuals who are diagnosed with with autism and then recover 
trust me, they go through a lot of work. It's not something that happens overnight. That's why I don't use the word cure, yeah. because I feel like they still have whatever it was that caused them, but they learned how to overcome it. And it wasn't an instant cure. It was a, rec it was a period of work, intense, heavy work. Um, that they've accomplished and they are now functioning like the rest of the world. So to me, that's really important. Um, and I see it as a very positive term. So now the question I would like to pose is um, they wrote, wh what was the last sentence? No one ever, or it's not, it's not true, it's false? Did they say something like recovering from autism is false? Uh, but to completely recover, uh, but, but the, what, the, what it's written here is, but to completely recovery is false. Uh, well, I would ask you why. Why do you believe that it is false? That's, well, I, I really want to know that because a lot of times people say that and we assume different things. I know yes. that some people assume no one can ever overcome all the symptoms. I would disagree with that. Yeah. I have I have individuals who are adults where you could never tell they had any issue at all ever in their lives. Yeah. Um, and they did, and they were pretty severely affected by it. Um, some of those individuals are on my recovered video, yes. you know? Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, sometimes people find uh, a negative connotation with the word recovery which that I understand completely. But to say that someone never completely recovers is false, I don't, I don't agree with that. Yeah. I would love to ask for elaboration on that. Okay, and we'll look forward to that. I've been in many discussions about this. We were just talking the other day. I had a friend come with me to the Autism Speaks Walk a couple of years ago, and she was helping to work mm -hmm. at our booth. And, and over the years, the way we have languaged autism in our house has changed. Like every yeah. couple of years, it changes. When my son was first diagnosed, and I would say to people, oh, my son is autistic. And then I, I hated the way that sounded. I mm -hmm. like that just didn't feel right to me. It just bugged me. And then I watched Holly Robinson Pete on Oprah, and I heard her say, well, I don't say he's autistic. I say he has autism because... You know, right. um, and I, and that felt better to me. So I started saying my son has autism. I know a lot of people don't like that. Right. It's like there's two factions, autistic or has autism, and both sides get completely rankles. And I, I welcome everyone to use the words that they want to use. They feel comfortable with. Right. And then when we started at CARD, I felt like it was really important for us to make positive, assumptive words. So I used to say to people all the time, my son, Jem, is actively recovering from autism. Yeah. Because exactly. every day, that's what we were doing. He was actively recovering from autism. Um, and then we got to a point where enough people said to me, that's offensive to me. Adults who are on the spectrum, mm -hmm. they said, it makes me feel like you think that I'm leprosy and I was mm. like oh I don't feel that way at all and if that really hurts your feelings I won't say that um Jem says now to people he says I had autism when I was a child yeah. that's what Jem says I love that and I want since since it should be um individual driven um and not you're... one size fits all um you know that's and I tr other than the show I have uh you know, he has given me permission on the show to talk about that. But other than the show, if I'm outside this building, I am not allowed to talk about his autism. Okay. He talks for himself because yeah. that's as it should yeah. be. He's 13 and a half and that's, and he worked really hard to have the privilege of being able to communicate that for himself. So um, our, our words keep changing with time. And I know, I know parents that through the medical system have gotten to the point where their child no longer qualifies for services because they no longer qualify for an autism spectrum disorder. And what the doctors stamped it was autism in remission. Mm -hmm. it's, we're mm -hmm. always dancing around the R words, which I find really interesting. Um, and, and when I've told See, friends- also I have a bigger problem with because remission implies that there's a chance that it could come back and that is why they're calling it that and because they think that it back. might that right. they think that it might or that you might need services down the road and so right. that's why right. they're, and right. I have friends right. who are on the spectrum who are like remission is all but you're making it sound like a disease mm -hmm. and I do think that that's part of the emotional thing of it is that the connotation is Negative. that we're saying that it's something bad but for me, how can we exist on a space where we say it's a disorder, right? Right, and but it's not bad, right? Like, how can these two things exist? And what I've started saying is, for myself, is the disabling aspects of autism. 
that that my son has right. I believe almost completely recovered from the not from autism but from the disabling aspects of autism. He still has all the things that his brain does differently because right. of autism. He still has that, but there aren't things that are gumming it up. Absolutely. So I think it's just really important for us to be very clear that there's no negative connotation when None. we say recovered. And there's no negative connotation when we're talking about overcoming it. people who have those symptoms either. Oh, absolutely. But if it's preventing them from being able to do that's something, right. then let's help them. I think that that's, that's the focus exactly. always. If they would like the help. I mean, yes. I often tell parents also, it's completely up to you. Because, you know, as a child, the parent is the one making the decisions, obviously. And I often tell parents, it is your decision which direction you, your child will go. That's but if true. you commit to this, then this is a pretty intensive program for the next three or four years, yeah. at least. Yeah. And it's a really a lot of work. Don't get involved with this unless you're willing to commit to this because it will, uh, it could become a negative experience if you do it kind of halfway. Yes.